Hello and thanks for joining us for House Calls, Real Docs, Real Talk. I'm your host, Mercedes Fuller. Today we're discussing my favorite topic and you know what that is, it's food. Specifically, we're going to examine nutrition and the best ways to fuel our bodies so that we can go out and live our best lives. And that sounds like a pretty exciting show to me, so let's get started. With me this morning is our friend, Dr. Maya Vadavalu, Assistant Professor of Nutrition and Food Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Vadavalu, welcome back to the show. It's so good to see you. Thank you. It's so great to see you too. And thanks for having me today. Yes, ma'am. And I definitely need so much help on this topic. So I'm so grateful that you're here. So let's jump into today's discussion with health in the headlines. Good health is always newsworthy, so each week we select one current headline that ties back to our topic at hand, and then we ask our expert to respond. So today we don't have to travel too far for this week's entry. Our own AHA newsroom has provided us with the following headline. Research says fat diets don't work. So why are they so popular? And Dr. Vadavalu, that's my question that I have for you. Why are they so popular if they don't work? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And I'd probably be out of a job if we had the total answer. To you. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I think they're so attractive for a few reasons. I mean, first and foremost, they really do offer a simple solution to a really challenging problem. Um, and what's not attractive about an easier solution? And then, you know, one thing that I really liked about that AHA News article, and I think we don't talk about enough, is that they really are selling an attractive fantasy one where weight loss just seems to be the solution to all of our problems that really have nothing to do with our body weights or what we're consuming. And so it really sells this fantasy that if you do this, then your whole life is going to be better. Um, and then from you know a nutritional perspective, they really do suggest quick results. And many of us, we know from research, can be restrictive in our dietary patterns for short periods of time. You know, If I have to do this for one week, I can tell myself I can do it. And that implied instant gratification of many fad diets is really appealing. And, you know, the idea that the changes that we see in our body and health are gradual and that we need to maintain those changes over time, well, that's a little bit less exciting um, than the messages that a lot of fad diets promote. Yes, doctor, I love what you say. These diets are selling a fantasy. Uh, and I have found myself a victim of some of those fantasies and traps by trying to do the thing that was the most popular. I think my favorite diet that I've tried uh, by far is the cabbage soup diet, which was popular in the early 2000s. And I think I did it about five times and it worked until I was ready to kind of consume all of the weight that I've lost in eating food. Uh, so let's get into our main segment. We call this segment, You Ask, We Answer. Doctor, I'm so happy to see so many cues in the in, so many questions in the cues rather, and they're they're waiting just for you. So let's jump right in. Our first question comes to us from Bruce, and this is what Bruce wants to know: What should we eat to take care of our hearts? Yeah, great question, Bruce. So we recently published guidance from the American Heart Association that's really encouraging people to ado adopt heart healthy patterns. And that, what we mean by patterns is that it's not a single pill. It's not a single food or food group, but rather the balance of all the foods that we eat each day. And so what we know from kind of decades of research now is that diets that, that promote heart health are high or in minimally processed foods like fruits and vegetables, whole grains, liquid plant oils, healthy sources of protein, um, predominantly from plants like soy, nuts, and legumes and beans, but also fish, seafood, low-fat dairy products, and lean cuts of poultry or meat if those are still desired. But as much as of what it encourages, it's also talking about 
minimizing intake of processed meats and foods and beverages that are high in added sugars or foods high in salt. And then the really you know, critical piece of that is as we all eat more outside of the home again, um, doing that wherever food is prepared or consumed. So, you know, I'm over here taking notes, doctor, and I heard a few things that kind of stood out to me. So minimizing the processed foods and minimizing uh, the sugars, Th that's those are some of my major problems that I struggle with. So thank you for sharing those notes, because I'm ready to kind of reassess my diet. And those are some of the things that I struggle with. So thank you so much for sharing that. Here's a question from Selena from Selena. She wants to know what exactly is plant-based eating? Is it the same as vegetarian or vegan? That's a great question. Yeah, I agree. And you know, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. So I think of plant-based eating as plant forward eating. It doesn't mean that you have to give up all animal products. Um, and that's particularly true of consuming animal products are part of your dietary preferences. But for everybody, it still means shifting the proportion of what we eat each day to include more minimally processed plant foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and legumes. Mm -hmm. Also, and you know, one thing that I'm hearing as well is that it's also gonna take a shift in the mindset as well as we shift some of these, these habits that we have as it pertains to our food. As we speak about plant-based dieting, uh, here's another question. Uh, how does plant-based eating benefit our health? Yeah, another great question. So there are really a lot of different ways that it benefits our health. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, and other minimally processed plant-based foods are rich in fiber and also in phytochemicals, which we know have benefits to our cholesterol, to our blood pressure, to our blood sugars, and also inflammation in the body. And then the other piece, you know, sort of speaking to your point before, when we choose these heart healthy patterns more often, we also reduce our consumption of foods like processed meats, foods that are high in added sugars or salt that do have adverse effects on those risk factors. So to me, it's really this like two for one where we're replacing processed meats or non-lean cuts of meats and poultry or foods and beverages that are high in added sugars or salt with more minimally processed fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, low fat dairy, and um, that's really going to work together to promote heart health. Awesome, I love that, the two for one. Now, this next question, I, this is one of my questions as well, because a lot of us, we want to see results really fast. And so this is the question from Alfred. Is it better to overhaul our diets all at once or make small changes over time? Yeah. So to me, from a behavior change standpoint, making small changes and sticking to them is better for encouraging lifelong adherence to heart healthy dietary patterns. And I think that's so important because the patterns that we're talking about today are not meant to be temporary. It's not meant to be something that you try for 30 days and then suddenly your health is great forever and you don't have to do this any longer. So we want those patterns to be enjoyable and to fit your dietary preferences and your cultural preferences. And in my opinion, it can be helpful to start with one thing, develop a habit, and then begin to add additional changes to your diet and lifestyle that promote heart health and that work with the other things that you have in your life. Absolutely. Now, this is another question that I've also wondered uh, because I've heard a lot about the Mediterranean diet. So here's a question from Robin. What is the Mediterranean diet and how does it help the heart? Yeah. So really the Mediterranean diet is one that is kind of inspired by eating habits in countries like Spain, Italy, Southern Greece, and you know countries around the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and we saw you know decades ago some benefits from that because um many of these patterns emphasize leafy green vegetables fruits nuts legumes whole grains particularly extra virgin olive oil within the liquid plant-based oils and moderates consumption of poultry eggs and red meats and sweets and what i really like about this is you can see that this is a pattern that really does align with the american heart association guidance but it's not limited um to you know, only achieving a Mediterranean diet to promote heart health. You can still adopt a lot of those principles um, and follow Mediterranean-like diets that also reflect your cultural preferences. 
I heard something else that's standing out. Moderate consumption of sweets. You know, that's my weakness. Anything with a C. This is what I tell the production team. Anything with a C is my weakness. So cookies, candy, cakes, those are my weaknesses. Here's a question from Vicky. And she wonders, you know, do you have any tips for how to shop healthy and how to save money at the grocery store? Groceries are getting high, Dr. V. Yeah, and groceries are definitely getting expensive with rising food costs, especially, you know, I hear a lot about people talking about produce. So some tips I have um, are to really, you know, shop sales and also what's seasonal for fresh produce. Often what's in season is less expensive than, you know, trying to buy, at least here in Rhode Island, berries and things uh, out of season. Those get pretty expensive pretty quickly. Um, but also, you know, when we're trying to encourage more produce, sometimes thinking outside the box and buying more frozen produce, um, you know, there's often this misconception that frozen is somehow less healthy than fresh, but in reality, it's picked at its peak nutrient density flash frozen. So it retains all of those nutrients and then is, you know, much more shelf stable. So it can be less expensive as nutritious and last longer, um, in your fridge or freezer so that you don't, um, end up having more food waste. Uh, additionally, I think, you know, shopping with a list can really help you stay um, on your plan and then uh, not shopping when you're hungry to reduce impulse purchases that also tend to add up um, when we're shopping. And then, you know, lastly, maybe when possible, buying some things in bulk and when you get home, separating it out into more individual serving sizes so that, again, you can reduce food waste and have the portion that you want to consume that week and then store foods that you want to consume, you know, later in the month. So many great tips. And I highly advise that we shop with a list and do not shop when we're hungry. Uh, one of the things that I've learned that benefits me is, you know, sitting down to actually plan the meals for that particular week or that particular time frame. And then that helps me uh, prepare my grocery list. And I try not to go to grocery stores where they have samples, uh, because if I go and I'm hungry and I'm sampling, I'll start to buy some of the things that I sample. So you know, great tips, doctor. Thank you for those. Uh, now, here's our last question, and it comes to us from Barbara in Nebraska, and she wants to know what tips do you have for making those small those small changes stick? That's a good question. It really is, and you know, I I think about this a lot. Um, I'd say that you know, like we talked about earlier with the small changes, try to begin with only one or two changes at a time, and choose the ones that seem the most appealing to you at first. Um, you know, make it a little bit easier to get over that first hurdle. Um, some things that have been effective from other people are that if you stay accountable with either talking to a friend about the change that you're trying to make or even just to yourself with journaling. Uh, and then one that I really like to emphasize when I work one on one with people is to not expect perfection. So if you make a choice that's less than heart healthy, don't throw out the whole pattern. Um, but just encourage yourself at the next opportunity that you're eating to make a heart healthy choice. Doctor, so many great tips and you caught me writing some notes. Listen, we have to make sure that we have those accountability partners. Uh, that's one thing that I have found to be so beneficial in my journey to try to lose weight and live a healthier lifestyle uh, is having those accountability partners that you know, they know my goals, they know what I should be doing. Uh, and a lot of them are taking the same strides as well. So I love that and not chasing perfection. That was such a great tip uh, because we have all these images around us that make us chase an image versus chasing that healthy lifestyle. So thank you so much, doctor, for sharing. Thank you for helping us untangle fact from fiction today. I feel like the information that you've given us, it's so much uh, information that we need it right now, especially as we're trying to live healthier lifestyles. Uh, and it's so much information out there. Uh, and information on correct diets can be so confusing. So I've definitely learned a lot from you today, doctor, as we always do. So I look forward to having a conversation with you in the future. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before leaving us on today? No, thank you so much for having me again. And you know, just remember, it's never too late to start eating a heart healthy dietary pattern. Every small changes count. 
And then you may not see changes immediately, but over time, they're all going to work together to support your heart health. Friends, you heard it directly from the doctor. It's never too late. Thank you so much, doctor. That does it for our show. You can find any of our previous episodes on our YouTube playlist. Make sure you head over there. And I encourage you to subscribe so that you can share the content with your family and friends. We hope that you enjoyed today's healthy food for thought. Uh, Remember to take care of yourselves and we'll see you next time. We've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat, and it's true. What you put into your body affects not only your cholesterol and blood pressure, but also your energy level, your memory, and the way your brain functions. So with that in mind, get it? Here's a healthy cheat sheet to boost your mental game. Eat a cup of greens every day to slow brain aging. Dark greens like spinach, kale, and romaine lettuce should find a place in your salad. Spinach has high levels of iron, Kale is packed with vitamin A, and romaine is loaded with folic acid. Not a salad eater? Sneak them into your morning smoothie. Eat from the sea at least twice per week. Salmon and albacore tuna are rock stars, high in brain-healthy B vitamins, shown to have a role in emotional balance. They're also high in omega-3s, which reduce the inflammation associated with cardiovascular disease. Not a fish eater? Look no further than flax seeds, chia seeds, or walnuts to get those healthy omega-3s in. Speaking of nuts, try to add nuts to your diet every day. A handful of nuts like walnuts or almonds are all it takes to deliver protein and some good fats that have been shown to improve brain functioning. Adding more greens, fish, seeds, and nuts might just boost your well-being and your brain health. It all boils down to healthy lifestyle habits like eating nutritious foods, staying physically active, and maintaining strong social connections. Learn more about House Calls, Real Docs, Real Talk, and submit your questions at heart.org slash housecalls.